All right, thank you all for joining me today to talk about how you can select and optimize Amazon EC2 instances. My name is Boyd McGeeky, and I'm the worldwide head of Spot Go to Market. We've got a packed agenda today, so we'll get right into it. We're going to start by talking about uh, the EC2 compute platform generally and how we have a, an offering for almost virtually every workload. Then we'll talk about how, with so many different options, you can think about selecting the right EC2 instance for your workload. Then we'll go into some of the tools that can help make that easy and automate that on your behalf. Uh, and then finally, we're going to end with a really critical elements, right? Once we've selected the, the instances that work for us, how do we make sure that we get the best price, the most capacity, uh, and we really optimize performance? Uh, and then we'll do with some concluding next steps. So to begin, it's a bit of a history lesson, right? 13 years ago, or more than 13 years ago now, Amazon EC2 launched the M1. At the time, it was a single instance for every possible workload. Uh, you know, the, the really exciting thing was not necessarily the M1, but the fact that you could pay for what you use. You could scale up and down and pay by the hour and give it back to us when you no longer needed it anymore. But naturally, that was just us getting started and customers said to us, hey, we love this elasticity thing, but we actually have a lot of different applications that have different performance characteristics. Um, and so then therefore we need more instance options. Fast forward over 13 years later, we have more than 400 instance options available to you across almost every imaginable category uh, of, of performance characteristics that you might care about, right? Whether it's general purpose, high memory, uh, whether you want you know, x86 architecture or these days, you know, ARM architecture in the, the chip as well. Uh, from Amazon's uh, own product, the Graviton 2. You know, do you need things like locally attached hard drives disks? Do you need locally attached SSDs? Or maybe you're actually happy with the, the options that we make available, like attaching uh, Amazon EBS to your instance, uh, or even you know, things op increasing options like maybe you actually want to attach an inference chip uh, to your compute instance uh, and do some work there. So over time, that portfolio of instance types has grown dramatically in response to, to you telling us, hey, there are different applications uh, that I need different performance characteristics to run in the most performant, available, uh, and lowest cost fashion. So let's dive into some of these characteristics now. So as I mentioned, uh, we have one of the broadest array of processes and architectures available in the world, certainly the broadest and deepest array of processes and architectures in the cloud. Whether you want Intel, uh, obviously, if you've been a customer for a long time, you've seen Intel has been powering a lot of our process, a lot of our EC2 instances for some time. These days, uh, you know, a lot of those instances are going to be powered by Skylake uh, or Cascade Lake from Intel. In addition, uh, over the last few years, you've seen a, a dramatic increase in the availability of AMD instances in the cloud as well. Uh, and right now, we're offering the Epic processor. Uh, and then finally, certainly one of the most exciting things for me to talk about um, is AWS Graviton 2 an ARM-based processor that was actually built by Amazon to deliver on behalf of the performance and price characteristics that customers were really crying out for. What do I mean by that? The Graviton2 instance type provides up to 40% improvement in price performance versus comparable current generation x86 instance types. Okay, so quite a significant potential saving that customers are starting to see by adopting ARM for their workloads. And while you might have been following the, the Graviton instance types in the cloud for some time, you might not be aware how broad this offering already is. So we have almost all the core family, right? We've got general purpose, the M6G, which was the first Graviton 2 instance launched, the compute intensive, the C6G, the memory intensive, the R6G. But new, we also now offer the T4G, a burstable instance type uh, that's delivered with Graviton 2. Um, and also the X2GD, uh, which is a super high memory instance type with the, the lowest uh, memory per price uh, of any instance type available. Now, not only do we have all of these different categories that you could consider using, we also have what I call the variants, right? So if you want locally attached NVMe SSDs, we now actually offer the M6GD, the C6GD, and the, X, uh, the X, R6GD, and of course the X2GD, which I've already mentioned, uh, for if you need that really blazing fast, locally, uh, locally attached uh, SSD storage. Also for the C6, the compute intensive instance type, customers told us that they actually want really high networking performance. Uh, and so we also now offer the C6GM, 
which has uh, 100 gigabits per second uh, networking performance. And of course, for those of you who are still wondering, uh, these instance types are all available except the, the T4 in bare metal as well. Okay, uh, so really excited about that. And one quick note, if you haven't already seen it, the T4G offers a free trial. So if you haven't experimented or played around with ARM and you're interested to learn a little bit more about it, well, there's a free way to get started, the T4G, uh, to, to really sort of test that uh, and experience that 40% performance, uh, price performance improvement uh, that a lot of customers are seeing when moving over to Graviton 2. However, it's not just CPU architectures where we offer a broad array of choices. We also offer the broadest array of accelerators, whether it's you know, NVIDIA's A100 Tensor Core or the T4 Tensor Core GPUs, Xilinx FPGAs, or even other Amazon created uh, chips, the AWS Inferentia, uh, the AMD GPU based instance types, and of course the Habana based instances uh, as well from Intel. Uh, so if you need not only really strong performance in the CPU architecture, but you have a lot of use case uh, and benefit from these accelerators, you'll also find uh, a broad array of options to meet the performance characteristics of your application uh, on EC2 today. So I might have begun by overwhelming you with options, right? With over 400 different instance types and multiple different variants and things that you can attach to different instance types, it isn't an unnatural question to say, wow, how do I pick the single best instance for me? What's the best one for me? And what I would say is selecting an instance is a process. Um, and it can take time to find the absolute best performance because your application characteristics might be changing, right? You're doing a new version. You're launching a, a new architecture of your application, whatever it may be. So don't overthink it. The really, really nice thing about being in the cloud is if you've made the wrong decision in the first instance type you selected, it's really easy during the next scaling activity um, to replace it with an instance that provides better performance um, or a lower price while, while achieving the same application performance uh, for you. So we're gonna go through this, but don't overthink it, right? The first thing I would tell you to do is do familiar, familiarize yourself loosely with the different categories of instance types we offer, right? Because you're gonna see things like general purpose, the M6 available across Graviton, Intel and AMD, right? So let's start by thinking about what are the general categories that might match the performance characteristics of my application? You know, do I need a lot of CPUs? Do I need a lot of memory? Uh, do I need hard drive disks locally attached? Maybe I need GPUs. Don't memorize these, uh, but be aware of them. And, and really most importantly, be aware that you can come back to this and take your performance characteristics through application, compare it, and then start narrowing down the choices uh, to find the best option. So as I said, don't focus on finding the single best instance to begin, because that's not necessarily the most efficient way to begin, because it's not just the single best instance, there's perform. Uh, sorry, there's also uh, different purchase models, and as we mentioned, there's different things to attach uh, that may deliver the performance uh, or the price you need in a different way. So start by thinking, let's not optimize, but instead let's think about flexibility first. Okay, so you know your application better than I do. And so when you start looking at your application, you say, well, I need at least you know, eight cores, I need at least 60 gigs of memory. There's a very good chance you are going to discover that there are a lot of different options that work for you. That is okay, that is the right way to begin. Begin by staying in that mentally flexible space, right? What are all of the instances that would meet you where your application needs, needs it to be? So that's why I say take an attribute-based approach to beginning. Don't work backwards from the instance types we offer, work backwards from what your application needs uh, and it will dramatically simplify this process uh, and really help you get the best bang for buck faster. So how do we think about attributes, right? That's, that's the same elements that we were talking about before. Maybe you need to run on x86 um, because your application currently just it doesn't have the, the integrations, the software uh, to work with ARM. Maybe you need really high performance CPUs. Maybe you actually do need locally attached SSDs. However, in most cases, the performance of EBS is going to, del to deliver on, on behalf of your application. It's going to exceed the performance requirements of your application. And it's going to do so in a way that's very cost effective and very flexible. Right? You can decide, you can scale that storage as your application changes and evolves or grows, whatever it may be. So 
Think about these different attributes, but make sure you're asking yourself, what do we need? Not what would be nice. Um, we can obviously add those things that would be nice later on once we get the general list of flexibility, um, but start by really focusing on what those core attributes uh, that matter most, uh, and let's make those the requirement. So let's just run through how to sort of structure thinking, right? So first and foremost, what processor do you need to pick? Um, and again, if you could use ARM and x86, that's great, right? Put both of those options in your mental bank and say, I'm actually flexible across both of these. That's a really great way to start. Can you take advantage of burstable performance, right? So could you use the T instance types that are great for workloads that have potentially really strong CPU requirements but they're not needed consistently. You know, the CPU need is burstable. So have a think about that. As I mentioned, do you need, can you use ARM? Um, great if you can, let's put that on the list. What is the minimum memory your application needs to run? And I ask this all the time is what is the minimum? Because remember, if we give you more memory and it happens to be cheaper, that's not gonna cause any issues. So what's the minimum memory you need for your application? And then another really important point uh, that customers should think about is, well, what's that CPU to memory ratio, right? So a lot of times uh, applications uh, are, are sort of combined with requirements on potentially, you know, for every X of memory, I need at least Y CPUs. And so understanding what is that ratio, you know, is it is it two CPUs for every four gigs of memory? Is it, we need at least 16 gigs of memory for every eight CPUs? What is that story uh, that your application really needs? Uh, and then finally, what are your network requirements as well? Uh, and, and sorry, in fact, this time, really finally, what are the accelerated computing options that you need as well? And again, keep coming back to that term need. Um, we can always find ways to, to add extra flavors and, and improve performance over time. Um, but really, I encourage you as you get started is, what are those core requirements so that we can keep it simple uh, and, and also keep it flexible? Now, certainly by now, I might have overwhelmed you by thinking, wow, there's so many options and so many steps to sort of walk through. Um, once I've found my performance characteristics, is there a way that AWS could actually make it easy to map my performance characteristics to the different instance types that they have available? Uh, because you might have, might have heard we have over 400. Uh, and the answer happily is yes. We haven't just invested uh, in, a, in expanding the instance portfolio based on customer feedback. We've also invested in tools uh, to simplify the process on your behalf uh, of finding those. So when it comes to discovering Amazon EC2 instances, we actually have two different ways that you can programmatically access this information. Uh, one of them is an open source project that I'll talk about in a minute. And then there's another project that is the single source of truth that provides the latest attributes, uh, all of the instance types, regional and zonal offerings, and pricing available. And through these APIs, you can actually compare the hardware attributes, the pricing, uh, and as I said, where they're available around the world. Um, but really what I wanna spend more time focusing on is the new Amazon EC2 instance selector. This is an open source project that was designed to be as flexible as possible in letting you tell us what are the performance characteristics of your application. So you can do things like you can filter on, I need memory performance. Uh, or I need network performance, right? These characteristics we were talking about, or even simpler, if you've gotten started with the C5 large and that works for you and you're wondering, hey, am I on the best instance type? What are some other instance types that are similar in nature? You can even put in the base instance type and say, you know, this is the instance type that, that I think I need to use. What are some others that I should potentially consider that have similar uh, or better performance characteristics for my application and, and maybe they're cheaper as well. Uh, and you can also do things like express that, hey, while I, I really need four vCPUs for every eight gigs of memory, I don't mind whether you give me a 16 vCPU box or a 32 vCPU box. Really, I, I just need that, that vCPU to memory ratio, and then I'm flexible upon how that's delivered. So it really tries to provide you these options so that you can uh, put in your requirements, and we'll return a, a full list of instance types that work for you um, to really narrow it down from 400 to hopefully a more manageable list um, uh, that you can then be flexible with. And we'll talk about how we can then automate the next step of taking that flexible list and automatically deploying in a way uh, that helps you sort of maximize availability, performance, and minimize cost. 
the, re the thing that I really like about this tool is it is open source, so you can go and download it and play with it yourself, build upon it. Um, you can add your own characteristics or build it into an internal service if that makes sense for you uh, with your own depth of knowledge around your applications that make sense. Um, or, you know, even simpler, it's available as a Go library. Uh, and so if you want to connect it and, and have it automatically integrated into your, your Go code uh, when you're making decisions, uh, that's absolutely a possibility as well. Uh, and I'll just point you towards uh, the, the GitHub link there uh, that you could go and explore. Uh, there's a lot of samples up there, uh, a lot of different examples that you can go through that will address very similar to what I've been talking about today. Uh, they'll walk you through how to think about those characteristics, how to put that into the instance selector uh, and have that automatically generate the list uh, that's going to work for you and hopefully a list that you'll just be able to throw into an auto scaling group uh, which as I say I'll show you in a moment. So now we've given you a, a list of instance types that meet the performance characteristics of your application right so you've done the most important part first which is starting by being flexible and finding all of the options and so now now is the time to start thinking how do I optimize for price capacity and performance. First and foremost, when it comes to the cloud, you don't necessarily need to think there is a trade-off between the cost and the performance for your application, right? So really, really critical to remember that. In fact, very often when we launch new instance types, they have better performance than the previous generation. And very often they're actually cheaper than the previous generation as well. So don't walk into this thinking you have to make a trade-off between cost and performance. That isn't what we're about to go into. Uh, in fact, very often it can be exactly the opposite. Okay, so by following the best practices we're about to go through, we're trying to optimize for both performance and cost. We shouldn't need to sacrifice one for the other. So let's start by talking about pricing. Amazon EC2 does offer multiple purchase options. I'm sure many of you are aware of this by now. If any of you have turned on an EC2 instance, uh, there's a very good chance you've launched uh, an on-demand instance. Uh, you know, this is an instance type where you pay for the capacity only when you need it. Uh, when you don't need it anymore, you can return it back to us uh, and we stop charging you one second later. Uh, it's a great way to get started and also just a great way to scale uh, applications that have dynamic use throughout the day. There's no long-term commitment. So if you need 100 servers for six hours a day, that's fine, you just use them and we'll only charge you for that six hours. So it's great for spiky workloads, great when you're getting started. But think seriously about how you can combine your on-demand usage with savings plans. Um, many of you are probably familiar with reserved instances. Savings plans offer the same great discounts as reserved instances, but they do so while giving you more flexibility, right? More flexibility to, to choose different instance types, potentially choose different regions, uh, really gives you the same savings while potentially giving you the ability to actually maximize those savings either, even further uh, while giving your developers greater freedom. Okay, so uh, definitely consider savings plans uh, in a, as a way to help optimize your persistent on-demand usage, right? That, that's the really awesome thing with savings plans is um, anything that's on all the time, you can save uh, significantly, I think up to 72% over the on-demand price. We'll dive into that in a moment. And then finally, um, as you might have guessed, uh, when, I, when I said my title at the beginning, we're not going to get through this presentation without spending a little bit of time talking about spot instances. Uh, they're uh, up to 90% savings versus the on-demand price. And, and just like on-demand, you pay by the second. When you don't need it anymore, you give it back to us. Um, and one second later, we'll stop charging you uh, for Linux-based instance types. However, the, the core thing about spot that's different to on-demand is it operates in our spare capacity. And so that means it's really good for fault tolerant, flexible and stateless workloads. Uh, and if you followed the steps that we've gone through earlier, there's a very good chance you've discovered that you are actually very flexible across multiple different instance types that will work for you. Okay, so think flexible when it comes to, to spot in particular uh, and think about that flexibility across instance types that might change over time you can still very often benefit from leveraging savings plans in detail. One extra point that's worth being aware of is that on-demand and spot are instance types that you launch. Okay, so you launch an on-demand instance, you launch a spot instance. You do not launch a savings plans instance. Savings plans is applied 
to on-demand instances, right? So very often customers will actually have servers running, EC2 instances running, and then they'll purchase a savings plan that will automatically apply to it. Similarly, if you have unused savings plans and you provision an instance type that matches the savings plan, we'll automatically apply that discount. So you don't launch a savings plan, uh, the savings just automatically apply to the on-demand instance that matches the savings plan. And so I talked about savings plans having the same, um, the same great discounts as reserved instances, but greater flexibility. So let's dive into what I mean by that uh, in a little bit more detail. There's actually two types of savings plans available for you. There's the compute savings plan and the instance savings plan. Let's talk about the compute savings plans first. It provides the greatest possible flexibility and savings up to 66% uh, over the price uh, of an on-demand instance. Approximately the same, well, it's not approximately, exactly the same savings um, as you would get using convertible reserved instances. Um, so if you're experienced with them, same level of savings, um, but a lot of the flexibility that you get from convertible RIs is automated in a compute savings plans. So if you want to swap from C5 to M5, you can do that. And the compute savings plan will just automatically notice, oh, we don't, we don't have C5s running anymore, we have M5s, let's apply the savings plans discount to the M5s. You could also swap regions, right? You know, let's say for example, that you were deploying in, in US East Ohio and, and for whatever reason, one of your customers or, or your business, it made sense to move more of your infrastructure into the London region. Uh, you could do that and your savings plans would continue to automatically apply. Um, let's say you make the, uh, you, you put in the effort and you uh, manage to get away from running Windows and move to a, a free operating system uh, and run on Linux, again, that savings plan is going to automatically apply. You lose nothing. You can swap tenancy from dedicated uh, tenancy if you'd like. Uh, and of course, even more exciting, if you're continuing to innovate uh, and move to a serverless model, those savings plans, the compute savings plans that we're applying to your EC2 instances can also apply to your Fargate or your Lambda uh, processes that are running as well. By comparison, there's the instance savings plan. This actually provides the maximum savings of any savings plans, um, but it does so by slightly reducing the flexibility. Okay, so it's, a, it's the same price point as a standard reserved instance, up to 72% savings, um, but the, the major sort of difference is it's an instance savings plans. And so you should take from that that you are committing to a specific instance family, not a specific instance family in size. So if you want to move from M5XL to the M54XL, that's fine, that will just work. Uh, even if you want to move from Windows to Linux again, that will just work as well. Um, but you can't move from C5 to M5, right? That's, that's the benefit that you get from the compute savings plans. Um, and that's the trade-off you, you give away to get the additional savings available for an instant savings plan. If you're really confident, you're going to continue to run on that same family um, for the next you know, 12 to 36 months, whatever it may be. All right, as I said, we're not going to get away without talking a little bit about spot instances. Um, the, the deepest total potential savings uh, of all of the EC2 offerings and only charged by the second. No commitment needed. Um, you know, use it when you need it. Give it back to us when you don't. Um, important point, Spot is the same infrastructure as on demand. That means it has the same security and performance characteristics as any other EC2 instance. It's not different hardware. It is just the spare uh, on demand infrastructure that's not being used, okay? Um, spot prices are actually now highly predictable and smooth, uh, or at least more predictable than they used to be. So if you still are under the assumption that um, spot prices vary significantly and, and potentially wildly throughout the day, you're operating on uh, a pre-2017 model of spot. Uh, so be aware, uh, it's much more consistent, much more predictable today. Um, we've talked about flexibility a lot. Um, the instance flexibility is how customers are able to deal with the fact that with Spot, the way we're able to offer you those up to 90% savings is that when we need the server back, we can take it back off you. However, if you're flexible, right, if you're able to use multiple different instance types for that application, then what most customers do when they run Spot is they automatically replace that Spot instance that was taken off them. Let's say, for example, the C4 large, and they replace it with the C5 large, right? So that flexibility is how customers are able to run with confidence uh, applications on spot consistently. Uh, and of course, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but we encourage you to combine these purchase models uh, together. 
All right, let's talk about how to think about sort of capacity across all of these instance options. And what I wanted to share here is really just some sample uh, use cases and workloads of how we normally see customers combining these different purchase options together, right? So databases, uh, you'll hear me say loud and clear and over and over again, please do not run your databases on spot. It's a terrible fit. Um, I love finding ways that we can help spot uh, work for you. Databases are simply not it. Um, you also will find that very often do you scale down a database. And so, you know, almost everyone's going to run that uh, fully covered by a savings plans, potentially even an instant savings plans to really maximize the savings there. A stateless web app by comparison, you're going to have a combination of savings plans for that, you know, mission critical element of the, the web service. And then a lot of customers are going to scale flexibly with spot. Um, well, I won't go through all of these in a lot of detail, but let's just quickly jump to gaming servers. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a passionate gamer myself, uh, and so I always recommend to customers to consider running their game servers, uh, their baseline on savings plans, and then scale dynamically uh, with the on-demand instances, uh, because I certainly don't want uh, my game interrupted, even if you can put me on another server quickly. Um, and then uh, by comparison, though, you look at something like job processing. Right, an asynchronous batch backend process, um, that could be a great fit to run almost entirely on spot if you're instance flexible uh, and you're fault tolerant with some of those processes. Um, you can take a look at the rest of these. Um, these are meant to be just samples, but they're based on years of experience uh, working with customers and, and helping them really optimize uh, and maximize their purchase option combination and how to get the most out of the elasticity that AWS provides. Um, and then this is, I'm really excited to talk about uh, using Amazon EC2 auto scaling groups because I talked a lot about getting uh, a list of instance types that work for you um, and then letting some system take care of uh, automatically optimizing them. Uh, and auto scaling is the answer, right? So with an auto scaling group today, you can actually combine on demand and spot. So the two ways to launch instances, as we mentioned earlier, you can combine both on demand and spot you can tell it to automatically optimize the spot instance selection based on where there's the most capacity available, where I'm least likely to be interrupted. And for on demand, you can actually just set the priority, right? Whatever's first in the list is what auto scaling is going to try first. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you a, just a quick example of this in a minute. Uh, and then the other important thing about an auto scaling group, uh, you know, you can automatically scale up and down based on demand from your customers. And similarly, in that example where you are leveraging spot, if a spot instance is interrupted, auto scaling is going to notice that and say, hey, there's a bunch of other instances you're willing to use. Let me find the next best instance type to deploy into, or in fact, now the best instance type to deploy into um, that maximizes your chance of getting capacity while minimizing your chance uh, of being interrupted. Interruptions do happen, but we want to help you minimize how frequently that's going to occur. So what does that mean with an auto scaling group? Can I actually put this list of instance types in? The answer is yes. With a mixed instance policy, you're actually able to provide a combination of on demand and spot, and you can change these dynamically uh, as you roll out new applications, as, as the conditions change, whatever it may be, you can decide you know, what is the on demand base capacity. Very often, you know, in this case, we've got three instances. In almost every case, I tell customers that those three instances should be covered by a savings plan because they're going to be on 24 by 7 because that's your base capacity. Uh, and then what we're saying here is the on-demand percentage above the base capacity will be 25%. And so that means uh, for every 10 instances launched, uh, you know, well, 10 instances is a bad example maybe, for every 100 instances launched, 25 of them are going to be on-demand and the other 75 are going to be spot. Uh, and the spot instance types uh, and the on-demand instance types are going to come from this same list, right? So by default, we're going to be just selecting C5 large first for on-demand, then C5A dot large. And really, these are just stack ranked based on what's the cheapest, um, right? We know they're all going to work for the application. So just stack rank based on the public on-demand price, um, and it's going to automatically go through that list. In this case, we've decided to put C5 dot large uh, the Intel based uh, instance type first, um, because for this application, they actually see really good uh, performance, uh, uh, price performance for the C5 large. For spot, however, you see the spot allocation strategy is capacity optimized. And that's going to do what I mentioned before. It's going to look at this whole list and say, how do we deploy in a way 
that maximizes your chance of getting all the capacity you want on spot and minimizes uh, the interruption rate that you're going to experience there. All right, so once you've finished this and you've done all the work to become instance flexible, you can actually just paste the list in here and then auto scaling take care of any of the complexity uh, of deploying and, and managing these different instance types. Uh, and then another really nice feature that I'll just mention briefly here is um, the capacity rebalance option as well. Uh, and this is an option where auto scaling will notice if there's an increased likelihood of your spot instance being interrupted, auto scaling will actually proactively go ahead uh, and start replacing that with a different spot instance uh, in the hopes that we can run through all of your lifecycle hooks and gracefully terminate that server uh, before it's interrupted by EC2. All right, finally, what about performance? How do I, how do I do, how do I maximize my savings while also maximizing my performance? If you've given me this whole list, but how do I automate knowing which in the list is actually best for me? And the answer is the AWS Compute Optimizer. The AWS Compute Optimizer recommends optimal instance types for your workloads that are actually running. It looks at the actual information. Uh, once you opt in, um, we will look at the performance characteristics that we can see and actually make recommendations and say, hey, maybe you don't need you know, the C5 too extra large. Maybe you need the C5 extra large. You're not using all that CPU or all that memory. But it's careful that it's not going to compromise performance. And so, you know, if you were using the memory, it's not going to make that recommendation. Um, we're, we're applying insights from across millions of workloads to make these recommendations as well. Uh, and so we're able to use the breadth of scale that, that AWS has in order to improve the recommendations and deliver deeper insights than, than potentially any individual customer would be able to do on their own. Um, and then, of course, it saves a lot of time, right? Uh, historically, before the AWS Compute Optimizer, you might need to go and pay a third party uh, or invest a lot of your own time qualifying different instance types. Uh, now with the Compute Optimizer, with this approach, we can have that automatically turned on, looking at the instances provisioned from this auto scaling groups uh, and making intelligent and automated recommendations that you can action. All right, let's wrap this up. Uh, we're at the end. What are the key takeaways? Familiarize yourself with the instance categories, but don't overstress about it, right? You pay by the second. You can swap instance types with compute savings plans. You can be saving money while continuing to find the best instance type that works for you. So don't overthink about it. Start from your attributes and work backwards to the EC2 instance types available. Don't go and look at the list of 400 and try to work out which to pick. No, start from your performance characteristics and work backwards. It'll help you narrow it down quickly uh, and get a flexible list of instance types that works for you. Use the selection tools. Let that automate that based on your behalf once you understand the performance characteristics of your instance types. Uh, and then after you've done all that, that is the time to start optimizing price, capacity, and performance with the different purchase options uh, and the tools and, and combinations that are available to you uh, and, and tools like the AWS Compute Optimizer, of course. Uh, we'll just wrap up here by, uh, by giving a shout out to the AWS Training and Certification. If you've been interested in any of this and you wish you'd learned a lot of it sooner, uh, there's a lot of resources out there to help you do it. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, reminder again, um, my name is Boyd McGeeky. Uh, you can feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Um, uh, and obviously, please complete the survey. Uh, we take these very seriously uh, and your feedback is, is more than welcome in how we create these presentations uh, and how we deliver them. So, so please take the time uh, to complete the survey.